We're going to start this week's Ask Jeeves Anything with a couple of questions that we asked you lot this time last week. Namely, define chipper and chopper. We had quite a few answers, but we're going to give one definition for each. And let us know if you agree or disagree in the comment section down below. Uh, first up, Griffs defines chipper. Uh, it says it refers to a race where the standard is so low that the prize is a fish and chip dinner. Calling someone a chipper implies that's the level of rider that they are. And James Ashcroft defines chopper. Uh, he says in the youth category, uh, they define it as someone who can't ride their bike properly and has, who is liable to cause a crash. Very interesting indeed. Uh, okay, on to the first question that we are going to answer here today. From Nate Nelson, are there any differences between a male and a female bike besides the colours? Well, yes, there are other differences, and it's mainly down to sizing and geometry. So a few bike companies have done some research and also looked into a database called the Global Body Dimension Database, which apparently shows that in general, women have got a slightly shorter torso and reach in comparison to their leg length than men. And so a lot of women's specific bikes have a shorter top tube and also a shorter stem to take that into account. However, as with everything in life, not everybody is the same. So even if you are a woman, you might not be best built for a women's specific bike. So always try before you buy. And if you want a lot more detail on this, you should watch this next video in which Lucy Martin asks, do you need a women's specific bike? So back to the initial question, do you really need a women's specific bike? Well, the honest answer is it actually depends. I raced almost every season on a men's bike, but I can see how some women would really benefit from having a women's specific bike. Let's face it, everybody uses different shapes, different sizes, regardless of gender. So you need a bike that basically just fits. And that may be a women's specific bike. Okay, next up is a question from Rajan Chitreo. Apologies again for the pronunciation. Uh, what should I buy as my first bike? A road bike, a cyclocross bike, or a mountain bike? Well, that is a very difficult question to answer without knowing exactly what type of riding you are hoping to be doing. And I'm guessing from the fact that you haven't written it down, you don't actually know yourself exactly what you want to be doing. So I would suggest going for that middle ground of the cyclocross bike or indeed a gravel bike because they're very versatile machines. They're pretty fast on the road, albeit not quite as fast as road bikes, but they're also more than capable of handling some off-road conditions. Maybe not the gnarliest descents in the world, but certainly gravel, fire roads, and also some single track as well. And if you really start to get the feeling that it's slowing you down slightly on the road and you want some more performance, you can always buy a second set of wheels with some slick tires, or just purchase the slick tires on their own and put them on the bike when they're needed. Now, we did a day's filming a couple of years ago in Wales where we explored the differences between a gravel bike and a road bike. It really was great fun indeed and it's coming up in this next video. You got punched yet Dan? Sod off. We should start the quick fire round off with a question from Andrew Lord who says, when using a maintenance stand on a carbon bike with a carbon seat post, where's the best place to clamp it? Uh, well, that is a very good question indeed. You'd always avoid clamping any of the tubes on a carbon frame set because they're not designed to withstand that force from the side, only to be strong in the direction they need to be when you're riding. The seat post one is a difficult one though because some people say it is designed to withstand that force because after all, there's a seat collar and clamp to prevent it slipping down. Other people say that if it is a very lightweight carbon, you do risk damaging it. So there are a couple of solutions, the cheapest of which is to buy a very cheap steel or alloy seat post, which you simply put in when you want to put your bike on the maintenance stand. Or the slightly more expensive option is to get one of those stands that the pro mechanics use, where the fork dropouts are secured at the front and the rest of the bike's weight is propped up at the bottom bracket and you can spin it round. So I'd recommend one of those if you have the money. Uh, next up, Ginger Coasty says, why are tubs 
faster than clinchers. Tubs being tubular tyres, of course, that are stuck onto the rim as opposed to clinchers, which you mount on and have a separate inner tube. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, Ginger, that they are necessarily faster. They might be in some cases. But during my time as a pro, I did a lot of research or online into what were the fastest rolling resistance tyres. And actually, some very fast clinchers combined with latex inner tubes were faster than the fastest tubular tyres. Now, I know a lot of people out there feel like tubulars are faster, but no, don't necessarily have any evidence to back that up. Uh, the reason a lot of pros still run with tubular tyres is because of safety. If you puncture on one of them, you can actually roll for quite a long time. And of course, on a mountainous descent with multiple hairpins, you want to still be able to ride quite safely without coming off. And clinches aren't so good for that. Uh, next up from Jorg Eduardo. Uh, an aerodynamic position is useful on the climb, question mark. Uh, I saw Jan Ulrich use it on the 2004 Tour de France in the individual time trial on Alpe d'Huez where he had some clip-on bars. Well, that depends on how fast you are riding up the climb. Jan Ulrich was probably climbing incredibly fast up Alpe d'Huez. And once you get over about 18 or 20 kilometers per hour, aerodynamics still has quite a major part to play as well as gravity and rolling resistance. So it just depends on how fast you're going up the climbs. Uh, Pierre Jung Heisch. Uh, can super glue be used to fix tyre punctures? I tried it once and it worked, but I'm not sure how long it can hold. Uh, at least it allowed me to ride back home. Amazing that you had super glue with you, but not a spare inner tube to go in your tyre. Uh, I guess it does work, as you've proven yourself. It's not something that I've ever tried personally, although I think I might give it a go just to try it out at some point. I know I have seen pro mechanics that use super glue uh, for the little nicks that you sometimes get in tyres to stop extra bits of thorn, etc., getting in and puncturing the inner tube. But now we'll try that out myself at some point. And finally, Douglas McCoyston says, hello, do I need to change my front derailleur if I'm changing my chain rings using the same size but different brand? And the answer to that is no. As long as the chain rings are the same size and they're also round as opposed to some of the uh, oval chainings that you get these days, then you shouldn't need to do anything at all to your front derailleur or indeed the rest of your gears. Here's a question which has been nagging Stephen Tovel for some time. Uh, what do Swanyers wrap food in for the riders? Foil parchment or what? Uh, and actually you're pretty close to the mark there. Uh, I did look it up a little bit earlier and we have featured this stuff in some of our uh, truck tours in GCN over the past few years. They don't use normal aluminium tin foil that you would use in cooking. I have tried that myself in the past when I've had nothing else at home. It does tend to get stuck to homemade energy bars and to rice cakes, etc. And it's quite difficult to unwrap as well in one piece, which is not what you want when you're in the middle of the race. So they get these packets of eight by eight inch parchment lined aluminium foil boxes. Uh, you will have seen them, as I said, on GCN's videos in the past. They're just much easier to unwrap which is exactly what you want in a race. Now, Swanyu's job is very interesting. They've got lots of tips and tricks along these lines, which you might not normally think about. And many years ago, all the way back in 2013, we followed Sophie from Garmin Sharp, as the team was known at the time, to see what goes into the life of a Swanyu on a daily basis. So we put two bottles, one of energy drink, one of water. We have two bars in air, cliff bars, and then one block and then uh, two gels of our sponsor cliff and we add a uh, baby coke because it's kind of good today good weather and uh, a fresh panini we made this morning the best part is right now with the pizza <laughs> oh and massage it's good part and but the job in here is pretty good too but the suitcases i'm gonna say the worst one our last question for this week is from Rex11. How do I find out if I am a climber or a sprinter? Uh, somebody already answered it for you and said, if you don't know, then you are a domestique, which is quite funny because domestiques are generally people that are quite good at everything but don't have one very specific strength. And it is quite easy to find out what you are good at and not so good at. Simply by riding with groups or even doing races, you're quickly going to find where your strengths lie. But you can also do some testing in a laboratory or out on the open road with the use of a power meter. Four quick tests, which include a maximum sprint test, a one minute flat out test, five minutes, and indeed 20 minutes, are going to enable you to create a power profile. So when you compare those test results to your weight, you'll get a power to weight ratio for each one. And then you 
can go onto a site such as Training Peaks and you'll be able to compare yourself to the very best at those particular durations and find out where your strengths lie. But it's not all about numbers. Take Mark and Cavendish as an example. He never performed particularly well in the laboratory and there are loads of people who've got way better sprint power than he has. But he's the best sprinter of a generation and arguably the best sprinter of all time. Anyway, if you do want to find out where your strengths lie and you have the use of a power meter, this next video is for you because it goes through exactly how to do all of those four tests. I think I can safely say that I got everything out of myself and you want to get that one right the first time because it's not something that you want to repeat twice on the same ride. Okay, now we're ready to start the five minute test. Now, like the one minute one, if you've got a climb of five minutes in duration on a steady gradient, that would be absolutely perfect. But if you haven't, do it on a straight flat road without any junctions and not too much traffic. That's it for this week's Ask GC Anything. Don't forget if you've got any questions which you would like us to answer, you can leave them in the comments section below this video or on social media using the hashtag talk back. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the Global Cycling Network if you haven't done so already. You can click on the globe which is somewhere on the screen right now and then you might want to watch one of the following two videos. In the left corner, my left, your right, just down here you can find a tour of the Katusha team truck from the 2016 Tour de France where you can see what the Soigneurs and the mechanics have on board and in the other corner you can see Cy and Matt trying to determine what is the best bike to use over cobbles, cyclocross, road or mountain bike.